Howdy, y'all. We're going to take a look at section 8.0 today, which is not an official section from chapter 8, but it's going to involve some algebra skills that are going to help us be excellent at chapter 8 when we need them. So the major skills that we're going to take a look at today are the skills about ratios and proportions, which are old algebra skills. We're going to start off with our first one, which is ratios, which is slightly easier, and then we're going to bump up to proportions. So a ratio is a, a relationship between two numbers, and it can be written a couple of different ways. First way, and my favorite way to write a ratio, is to write it as a fraction. So anytime you see a fraction, especially if it's simplified, that is a ratio of numbers, the top number and the bottom number. Another way that gets uh, used is if you put a colon between the numbers. It's a little easier to type out, so you see that oftentimes. When you're discussing ratios, a lot of times what gets used is the word two. And so you might hear that get thrown in between the two numbers. A ratio of two to one, a ratio of two over one, a ratio of two colon one. They're all going to be the exact same. So it's a, a, the different ways you can write them. Let's take a look at a couple. So this right here is a ratio. And what we have is we have two lengths that are in centimeters. And it says that we need to simplify this ratio. And basically what that means is you need to find a common factor and pull it out. Now, personally for me, I think that this is easiest when it is written as a fraction. And so I like to take a couple minutes and rewrite the ratio as a fraction, and then I can simplify it. A good common factor for seven, 76 and eight would be the value of four. So what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna divide by four on the top and on the bottom. And when I do that, that's going to give me my very best reduced version. 76 divided by 4 is going to go down to 19, and 8 divided by 4 is going to go down to 2. That's a much better reduced fraction. Let's include the units still. So we had centimeters before, and we can still have centimeters for these ones as well. There you go. Our second one that we have right here is another ratio. This time it's written as a fraction, which is a little nicer. Something I want you to notice about this one is that our units are mixed when we have four feet and then we have 24 inches. Having consistent units is nice, but it is not required for a ratio. So it's okay to have them mixed right here. So don't worry about having to convert from four feet down to inches or to take your 24 inches and convert it up to feet, not required. So we can leave it exactly how we have it right here and just reduce. The best common factor for four and 24 is four itself. So once again, we can divide by four and get ourselves our very best ratio. Simplified ratio this time is going to be one and six. Once again, having units on this one is particularly crucial because of the dis, uh, the similarity between the units. One foot is related to six inches. Now let's do a little bit of a cheat. Let's use our calculator for a second here. So if we go back to our original ratio that we had here, 76, and we divide it by 8, we're going to get a decimal of 9.5. And if we take a look at our new ratio that we created, 19 over 2, if we divide those, we're also going to get 9.5. When you have two ratios that will produce the exact same decimal, those are called equivalent ratios. So they are going to be the same. They certainly don't look the same, but they are equal to the same quantity of about nine and a half. And so they're considered equivalent to each other. Same thing over here. If we take our four and we divide it by 24, we get 0.1666 repeating. And if we take one and we divide it by six, we get 0.166 repeating as well. These are also equivalent ratios because they're equal to the same decimal value. All right, now what do we do with these ratios? Well, there's plenty of things we can do with them, but most of the time what we do is we do some comparing and so what we're going to do in this problem right here is we're going to compare some lengths and some widths. It says the perimeter of a rectangular table is 21 feet, and the ratio of its lengths and its widths is 5 to 2. Find the length and the width of the table. So just like any kind of good geometry problem, having a picture it would be best. And so I'm going to draw myself my best rectangular tabletop. And I'm going to label it. So I'm going to label it in three ways. First, I have this ratio of length and width, which is 5 and 2. On my long side, I'm going to label it with my 5. And on my short side, I'm going to label it with my 2. Uh, you can label it any way you'd like. And then the other one that we have is our 21 feet for our perimeter. And the deal for perimeter is I want you to try to remember that when you're talking about perimeter, it is as if you are taking a walk around the entire shape. So what we're going to do is we're going to be going across the top down the right side, across the bottom, and up the left side. And if we make all of those distances and put them together, we should get 21 feet. 
Okay, so now if you notice, we went across the top and bottom. We went up the right side and the left side. So there was four different values that we were adding up. And if you add them all up, you should get 21. Now, based off of my labels that I have here, my two distances that I have are five and two. Those came from my ratio. And so if I start putting in fives and twos, it looks pretty good, but there's a problem here. And the problem is that if I take all of my fives and twos, five plus two plus five plus two, I should get 21. And the deal here is I don't, I only get 14. So the thing is that the fives and twos are not great yet. And the thing that we're looking at right here is a ratio of five and two that's been reduced. So we're looking at this version of the ratio right here, but what we need is this version of the ratio when it was a little bit bigger. That bigger ratio will give us the accurate side lengths for our length and our width so that we can figure out what's going on with our table. So how much bigger should we make them? Should we take all of our fives and twos and should we double them? Should we triple them? Do we need to multiply them by 1.5? I'm not sure. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a variable. And just like with these top problems, what you notice when we were working with these top problems right here, we were very consistent with what we were doing. We were dividing by the same thing over and over again. And so same thing here, we're gonna use the same variable over and over and over again. We don't need a different variable for the length and then another one for the width. We can just use the same variable because the ratio is gonna be consistent. So now what we have is we have an equation that will work. As soon as we can figure out what X is, we can figure out what our length and our width is and that's gonna be a lot better. So let's use our algebra skills now. We're gonna use the same skills we had in algebra one. Let's combine some X terms together. If we combine all of these X terms together, we're gonna to end up with 14 X. And that is equal to 21. Now to solve a problem like this, 14 X is equal to 21 is really quick and easy. Do a little bit of division and you'll get your X value. Our X value is gonna be a decimal and that's okay. That happens sometimes, don't panic about it. We are gonna get a value of 1.5. Okay, so what does that mean about our length and our width? Well, our length, if you take a look right here, was five X. And so now our new length is going to be five times 1.5. Or if you wanna get a little bit more specific, that's 7.5 feet or seven and a half feet. Our width was two X. And now for our width, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two and multiply it by our new X value of 1.5. And when we do two times 1.5, we're gonna get a new width value of three, three feet to be specific. Okay, so now just to double check and make sure that everything is working appropriately, if we take these lengths and widths and we add them up in the same way that we were talking about with perimeter before, a 7.5 and a three and another 7.5 and another three, we should get 21. And the deal here is that if you add these ones up, you definitely get 21. So now it checks out just fine. 7.5 feet and three feet are our perfect final answer. All right, now it's your turn. I want you to see if you can try out the next problem on your own. It's about Josh and he's painting a barn door. Now I've got a little bit of a warning here for you. In this problem, I want you to notice that they mention perimeter and they also are mentioning area. It's gonna bump up the complexity a little bit, but I know that you're up to the challenge. All right, here we go. For our you try it problem right here, we're gonna start off with our picture. Here's our barn door. And the ratio was once again, three and five. So we've got our three X and our five X right here. Now I am gonna use my three X and my five X repeatedly for my perimeter, which is gonna be 64. And I'm gonna be able to solve for X, which is gonna give me an X value of four, a little bit nicer than the one that we did together. Now, remember that once you have your X, you gotta plug it back in. Three X is now three times four and you get a value of 12. And 5x is now 5 times 4, and we get a value of 20. So this barn door is now 12 feet wide and 20 feet tall. All right, great. And so now uh, the last part, like I had mentioned earlier, was find the area of the door. So we don't just need the length and width, we need the area. Remember that area is different than perimeter. When perimeter, we were adding the values together. But for area, all you have to do is length times width. So we're going to multiply, and we get our value of 240. Also, notice your unit right here. It's 240 feet squared because area has to be squared while perimeter does not. All right, next example, number three right here. It says find the measure of the angles in triangle B, C, D. Okay, so now we've got a triangle B, C, D. I don't know what kind of triangle it is. Maybe it's a right triangle. Maybe it is an isosceles triangle. I'm not quite sure. 
but that doesn't really matter. What we want to do is we want to take a look at these angles, and they are going to be in a ratio of 2 to 3 to 4. Okay, so now if you remember from last semester, there's a magic number that all of the angles in a triangle have to add up to. If you take all three angles in a triangle, they must add up to 180 degrees. Okay, so but we are running into the same problem. If we take a 2, a 3, and a 4, it certainly does not add up to 180. But once again, that's because this ratio has been reduced. And so what we need to do is we need to unreduce it or we need to bump it up. So in order to do that, we are going to bump it up by multiplying by a variable. And we're going to use the same variable for each uh, angle. Now what we have is we've got three angles right here that are 2x, 3x, and 4x, and they'll be big enough. So I'm going to combine those together, and that's going to give us 9x. And we can divide that, and we're going to get an x value of 20. Okay, so now an x value of 20 is pretty good, but it says find the measure of each angle. So remember that one of our angles had the ratio of 2x, and now that angle is now 2 times 20. So there is an angle that is now going to be 40 degrees. Our other angle that we had was 3x, and now that's 3 times 20. That's going to be 60 degrees. And our last angle was 4 times x, and now that's 4 times 20, and that's now going to be 80 degrees. Just a quick little double check on that one. If we take these three angles and add them together, we definitely do get 180. So these are going to be our very best angle measures. All right, next part. In order to bump up the complexity a little bit, we're going to take a look at another topic, which is called proportion. And a proportion is very similar to what we've been taking a look at. A proportion is when you have two different ratios that are equal to each other. And when you have two ratios that are equal to each other, you can do some pretty special things, especially if one of the parts of the ratios is a mystery to you. So this is going to be our kind of our setup. We're going to have a ratio, another ratio, and an equal sign in the middle. Equal sign in the middle is the extra special part and the part that I need you to make sure that you're watching out for. It is not a multiplication sign or addition sign or a subtraction sign. It is an equal sign. Let's take a look at our first example. It says, Katie wants to find the total number of rows of boards that make up 24 lanes in a bowling alley. So we've got, you know, 24 lanes with 24 sets of pins at the end of them. And we want to figure out how many pieces of wood you would need. Um, this is really important if you're ever doing construction and you're ordering supplies. You want to make sure that you order enough supplies that you can get the job done without ordering too much and wasting money. Um, you don't also don't want to be too conservative and not order enough, and then you have to go to the store and buy more, and it might take a long time and wasted uh, wasted time is wasted money. So what um, Katie did is she went and she just looked at three lanes. She's noticed that there were 117 rows of wood in three lanes, and then she wanted to see if she could figure out if she could use that information to figure out about 24 lanes. Well, here's the deal. 117 rows of wood in three lanes is a really good ratio. And so you can build that out into a ratio of 117 over 3. You could also just as easily build that out into the ratio of 3 over 117. It really doesn't matter. Whichever one you would like is fine by me. But in general, what we've got going on right here is we've got rows on top and we've got lanes on bottom. If you want to flip that, you definitely can. It's up to you. Okay, so now here's the thing though. What we really want to know about is we really want to know about the situation with 24 lanes. Now 24 is once again another lane value, so I'm going to line it up right here with the three. And the deal here is that I don't know how many rows of wood it's going to take, and so I'm going to use a variable to represent my rows of wood. So now what we have is we have two ratios that are equal to each other, but there's a missing fact in here, and we're going to see if we can find it. This one is pretty easy to solve, and so you could do it a couple of different ways. And if you remember from middle school, you probably learned some good strategies, and you're welcome to use them right now. I'm going to show you the way that I like the most, and you might look a little different, but I'm going to show you why it's important to try it out my way when we get to the backside. So here's the technique that I like to use. I like to use something called cross multiplication, and we're going to multiply on two diagonals. Our first diagonal is right here, and we're going to take our 117, and we're going to multiply it by 24. When we do that, we are going to get 2,808. Our second piece of multiplication is we multiply our other diagonal, which is going to be 3 times x. Now, the deal here is that cross multiplication is quick and really helpful. 
Um, a lot of people are not very comfortable with fractions or ratios. And so when you cross multiply by, like this, you eliminate the fractions. You now have two pieces of information that still have the equal sign in between them, but no more fractions. And this is really easy to work with. If I want to solve for X, I just need to do one more step, which is going to be to divide by three. We take our 2,808 and divide it by three. We will get our X value. And our X value is 936. 936 rows of wood. That's how much wood you would need to buy in order to cover all 24 lanes. Quick and easy. All right, now it's your turn. So yours is about a small gymnasium and it contains six or 10 sets of bleachers. You uh, count 192 spectators and three sets of bleachers and the spectators seem to be evenly distributed. Your job is to estimate the total number of spectators. Set up your proportion, cross multiply, solve for your final answer. Here's our 192 and our three set up in a ratio. If you wanted to reduce that, you can try to do that. That's totally fine. Here's my second ratio right here of X and 10. Once again, I have all of my sets down here in the bottom and I have all of my spectators up here in the top. I'm gonna to cross multiply on my two diagonals to get 100, 1,920 is equal to three X. And then I'm gonna divide and I get 640 spectators. It's quick and it's easy and it works well. All right, our next type of question that we have right here is about a proportion uh, and ratios combined. So if you notice, both of the words are in your directions this time, which is nice, uh, but can also be a bit confusing. So here's the deal. You do have two different fractions or two different ratios. And basically the idea is we need to decide if they're equal to each other. Now I've got two different ways to do this job and I'm going to show them both to you. And I'm going to guess that there's going to be one that you like and one that you don't like. And that's fine. You can pick the one that you like the most. Here is the way that I like the most. What I like to do is I like to reduce my fractions. So five over three is pretty nice. And so I don't believe I'll be able to reduce that one at all. So I'm gonna leave it alone. But 35 and 21, those numbers are big. And so if I can reduce those, that would be excellent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take both of those numbers and see if I can come up with a good common factor. 35 and 21 have a good common factor of seven. So if I divide the 35 by seven, I'm gonna get a five. And if I take the 21 and I divide that one by seven, I'm gonna get three. What are you noticing about our first fraction and our new reduced version of our second fraction? Well, now it's pretty clear that they are identical to each other. And so that's your first technique and it works great. Here's another technique that I also think works really well. And I, this is the one that I'm gonna guess you're gonna like a lot. If you take a look at our first fraction, it was five thirds. And if you look at the decimal version of that, that is 1.67. If you take a look at your second fraction, that was 35 over 21. And if you look at the decimal version of that, it is also 1.67. The decimals match up as well. And that is just as good of a reason to say, yes, yes, these guys form a nice proportion. So now we've got a second one right here. And I want you to try it out on our second one to see if that one works for a good proportion as well. Well, like I said, I'm gonna guess that you probably went for the decimals. And so eight over 56 reduces down to 0 0.14, six over 28 only reduces down to 0 0.21. So those ones are not nearly as good. Let's take a look at our last couple problems right down here. Okay, so now for our last problem that we have that we're gonna work on together, what we I want you to notice is that we've got a couple of variables. We have two ratios with an equal sign in between them, but we also have two X's. This is a particularly complicated problem and one that I am more than excited to put on your first checkpoint of semester two. The deal here is that if you wanna to try to solve this, you can use a couple of different techniques, but this is where I think that that cross multiplying technique that we used earlier really pays off. And so um, if you want, what you can do is you can multiply on your diagonal right here, two times four X. And then you can multiply on your other diagonal right here. And that is gonna be five times X plus three. 
Now I'm going slow right now. So I want you to notice that I haven't completed any of my multiplication. I've just set it up. I also want you to notice that when I set it up, I set up everything in a row. There's no more fractions in this problem and that's on purpose. So let's do some multiplying. Two times four X is actually eight X. And if we do our multiplying over here, we're gonna use the distributive property and five times X plus three is now five X and 15. This one is pretty easy to solve, but it's gonna take a couple extra steps. I'm gonna start by moving my five X over to the other side and I'm using opposite operations in order to do it. And now I'm down to my last step. My last step is when I'm gonna divide. And when I divide, I'll get my X value. If you're ever concerned if your X value is a good one or a bad one, don't forget that you can always check. This is one of the most important parts about algebra and usually the first thing that students skip. So in order to check, what I would do is I would take my five and plug it back in. When you plug it in, you want to plug it in everywhere that you see the X variable. So now that's now going to be two over five plus three. And that's going to be five over four times five. All right, so I'm going to see if I can do some simplifying down here in my denominators. That's now two over eight, and that's going to be five over 20. Now the fractions right now don't look the same, but you could reduce them, or you can type them into your calculator to get the decimal. I like to reduce. Two over eight reduces down to one over four, and five over 20 also reduces down to one over four. If you typed them into your calculator, you would have gotten 0.25 and 0.25. It would have told you that the ratios are proportional, and that your answer is a good one. There's one more for you to try out right down here, and it's particularly tricky. When I cross multiplied for this one right here, I'm gonna do my X times X plus three, which I have set up here. And I'm also gonna do three times four X. X times X plus three is tricky because when you use the distributive property, you actually end up with an X squared term and a three X, and then you have your 12 X over here. Now we do need to combine some like terms. Both of these terms have X's in them. And so we can combine them together. So if you notice, I'm gonna move my 12 X over. Now for many students, they're gonna say that that's a very funny move. They wouldn't mind having all the X's over here where the 12 used to be, but I have a great reason for that. So if you take a look, what we have right now is we've got an X squared term and a nine X term, and they can't be combined together because of that power right there. And so my solving technique is gonna be surprisingly different. What I'm gonna do in order to solve this guy is I'm gonna use factoring. I'm gonna factor out my binomial by pulling out a common factor from both of these terms. Both of them have an X in it. So I'm gonna pull that X out and I'm gonna leave the parts that are unique over here in the parentheses. Now, it's very special that this problem is equal to zero because the only way you get zero is if one of these two terms is actually equal to zero. So I'm going to set my first term equal to zero, and I'm going to set my second term equal to zero as well. And that's going to allow me to solve for two different possible solutions. One of those solutions is x equal to zero, and one of them is x is equal to nine. I don't know if you remember those things, but your Algebra 2 teacher certainly does. And they're going to hope and expect you to be an expert at this when you show up to Algebra 2 next year. So it's important that we practice some of these old factoring techniques now so that you're ready for Algebra 2 next year. Please take a couple moments and see if you can get started on your 8-0 practice problems next. 